I am really pleased to be here. It's a great, it's a great pleasure uh, because I'm a, such an admirer of the Gresham tradition. And um, also, I know that you've had a, a, there's been a series of lectures on um, illustrations, on satire, uh, and on book illustrations. And this uh, little talk, rather than a lecture, is a is a sort of overview, but um, not of a particular tradition. I was just very interested because of a personal interest, not an academic interest, in the way that uh, words and pictures go together so often, uh, and also very interested in the way that children start to look at books, and of course what they look at uh, is the picture, but they very often then learn the words almost off by heart, so they turn the pages if it's a fairy story, and they always say, once upon a time, in a country far, far away, there was, and then they look at the picture and tell the story. Um, and I think this is an ancient way, actually, of reading and of imagining narrative. Um, and I'm just going to talk today about three, really, different ways that um, artists have responded to texts. Uh, one is the uh, way that artists illustrated Milton, uh, book illustrators, and then people who we think of as, as independent artists. Uh, the second is... Um, not an artist responding to a text, but an artist and writer working together, and that's Hogarth and Henry Fielding. Um, and then the third uh, is one which, of course, is, is sort of so obvious that uh, we take it for granted and, and was mentioned in the introduction, which is where um, the writer uh, commissions an artist, and the artist is often so brilliant that they create the images that the reader sees. So uh, it was about whether there's any tension uh, in that kind of work. That's a uh, writer and an artist working together sort of formally. Um, and I just put this little picture up as a beginning, partly because uh, I love uh, Edward Lear, because that's one I'm not going to talk about, where the writer and the artist are, is <laughs> the same person. But also when I looked at it um, the other day, I thought, well, uh, this is words and pictures. Uh, this is the owl and the pussycat, uh, you know, went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. Um, and here we have it. And the word, uh, I was think on the jar, which I'm sure you can see that Leah chooses to use is honey. Uh, I think that this picture would have had an altogether different feel if he had chosen to write money. <laughs> something, it would have been distinctly less, uh, less romantic. Um, so, th the other thing also when I started thinking about this whole tradition uh, is that it is so ancient. And the earliest uh, illustrated uh, book, if you like to call it, or narrative, um, or instruction manual, because that's where pictures are invaluable, um, was the, uh, that we know of, was the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Uh, much in the news at the moment, I don't know if people saw it at the weekend in one of the uh, weekend newspapers, great illustrations from that. And that was where the pictures um, actually had a sort of act like a kind of spell in that they illustrated the things that the soul would need in the afterlife. So the picture sort of was the image. And it's um, been uh, sort of almost inseparable from uh, religious texts uh, from the beginning that people want to see or teachers or preachers want to use uh, an image that will convey uh, the message that they're trying to uh, get across. And that, of course, could be, you know, frescoes on the walls of churches and things. And, and also that um, illustration itself is a, is a kind of worship. It's a way of making the text beautiful. And so we in the West and, and in this country have this marvellous tradition of uh, illustrated manuscripts. And one of the ones that um, I love the, uh, particularly um, is the Luttrell Psalter. Um, and that's another kind of thing. It's like misericords in cathedrals and things like that, where the illustrations don't actually seem to have much bearing on the word at all. But um, the Luttrell Psalter 
shows the life of the English land through the year, through the seasons. And it has the effect, of course, of making the Psalms absolutely related to the lives of the people that they're addressing. And it's particularly beautiful too, I think. I think this is harrowing. And some of you might have been watching Mike Wood's television programmes about the history of England, the Leicestershire village, um, and all the little scenes that they showed of farming in the Middle Ages um, came from details uh, in the Luttrell Psalter. So this is a kind of work where the artist is responding with two, three kinds of of uh, love and, and involvement, one with the text and the spiritual dimension, the second with the sheer beauty and elaboration of, of making a page look wonderful, and the third with an idea that they really want to record ordinary things that are, that are going on. So you have that kind of tradition of, of illustration. Uh, and another equally old tradition is... Uh, instructions really, manuals, technical books, herbals, uh, things where you need to see uh, what you're talking about. And it was uh, Leonardo, uh, was very struck, said the more minutely, and we've all probably tried to do this, you describe things in words, uh, the more you will confine the mind of the reader. It becomes immensely complicated and technical if you're trying to describe the relationship of details. Uh, and the more you will keep him from the thing described. And so it is necessary to draw and to describe. Um, and I think it's those two senses, one which is sheer enjoyment and the other which is actually conveying information. But when I turn to uh, sort of major texts, I've been working on, well, recently on the Restoration and it astonished me that within a couple of years or really even written at the same time you have two completely divergent uh, great British classics both of them in a sense spiritual works and that's uh, Pilgrim, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and Milton's Paradise Lost both written sort of under intense pressure during the restoration and completely different traditions one prose simple address to the ordinary people um, the other uh, a grand poetry always thought to be more difficult um, a Latinate a huge imaginative scope and this when I, you looked at how they were illustrated you saw these two traditions of literature but also of art sort of diverging in different directions um, this is Robert White's lovely portrait of uh, Bunyan, which was the frontispiece to the third edition of um, The Pilgrim's Progress. And it's thought to be a really quite an accurate portrait of Bunyan. And it tells the story, there is Christian with the burden on his back and a book in his hand, walking up the hill towards the heavenly city on the top. Uh, but mysteriously, and this isn't actually in The Pilgrim's Progress, beneath the dreamer, because it... it, it the, the Pilgrim's Progress begins, you know, in the middle of the life, I dreamed a dream and I saw Christian. So it's about the imagination and the vision of Christian. But Bunyan doesn't talk about this strange lion beneath the dreamer. That's, that's white. That's his own uh, way of sort of coming into it, as, as if all the passions and all the dark feelings, which Bunyan certainly does describe, are there beneath the dreamer. Now, this is quite a sophisticated uh, print, but it's still very direct and very simple. And if you look at um, uh, Paradise Lost ones, this is nearly sort of ten years later, they seem to come from a completely different tradition. This is the uh, wonderful moment when um, uh, Satan is summoning his legions, prodding them to rise up. And he says, on that inflamed sea, he stood and called his legions, angel forms who lay entranced, thick as autumnal leaves that strow the books, brooks in Vallombrosa, where the Etrurian shades high over arched embower. So it's a dark uh, uh, moment. And I suppose that the souls on the, on the floor of the sea do look a bit like um, autumn leaves. Uh, but 
there was something odd about this in that Milton certainly uh, never tells us that Satan is uh, garbed in a, a sort of Roman uh, costume. Uh, and uh, uh, also, when you look at it, he looks as if do you, you think he's sort of punting. Or he's, yeah? <laughs> um, and indeed he is, because this is... is this was a commercial proposition. Um, the publisher wanted to do a high-class, beautiful uh, edition of uh, the great uh, classic, and so he hired his artists. And reading Milton, it's quite hard to know where to begin describing what he says. How do you do autumnal leaves, strewing the brooks, fall and rose, etc.? So what the artist did was look at other illustrations, um, and this one, uh, as has been pointed out, the figure of Satan... Um, actually comes from uh, 1560 engraving, completely different by Van Heemskerk, which is of Charon rowing the souls across the sticks. It sort of fits, but it doesn't quite fit. Um, and uh, it set a tone, though, for Satan uh, ever after appears in this Roman uh, gear, in this wonderful sort of Roman kilt. Um, and um, Paradise Lost was very popular to illustrate, a rather sort of grand, and there was a particular boom, a sort of vogue, at the end of the 18th century, and Milton becomes adopted as a, as a national epic poet. All his republicanism is forgotten and everything like that. And during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, there were about 60 editions of Paradise Lost uh, between seven, uh, um, 1780 and 1825, um, and um, he was terribly important to the poets as well as to the artists. And you have Wordsworth writing this uh, wonderful uh, sonnet. But Wordsworth said he felt faint uh, when he read the description of Satan from a sense of beauty and grandeur. So this grand form is very important. And he called on uh, Milton. He said, Milton, he said, England hath need of me thee. We are selfish men. Oh, raise us. Up, return to us again. And um, this heroic Satan is the one that they choose to illustrate. And among the painters and artists, of course, the artist who responded most strongly, perhaps, to Paradise Lost was William Blake. I could show you lots of other Miltonic illustrations, but just today I'm just focusing on one or two. And here, Blake uses this sort of Michelangelo figure, this heroic Satan, and that's him summoning his legions. He's not prodding them anymore. He's saying, raise up, raise up. Um, and he's lost his garb altogether. He is the grand, naked energy of the world. Malign energy, but energy nonetheless. And so Blake makes it much more dramatic, a much more bodily poem. And he does the same with this wonderful uh, temptation of Eve, uh, where the serpent is entwined around her. And he did two sets of uh, illustrations, uh, 12 watercolours in each, but they never actually were applied to the book. So this is moving out again. This is not an illustration. This is the artist responding to the text, and he can be a little bit more free. Um, and Blake, interestingly also looked back at Bunyan, whom we've left on one side. Now, what had happened to Bunyan illustration, whereas Milton had got grander and grander and, and smarter and smarter and more and more beautifully engraved, um, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress had become a popular favourite, uh, hawked around the country by uh, peddlers in their baskets, a sort of chapbook, and the illustrations had become very crude and very formal, and they often took exactly the same uh, shape. Um, in fact, there were always sort of 14 illustrations, and when Blake looked at it, he, he did his own little set, and he did them small, so it, it seems that he did hope that they would be actually used in a book, but they never were. Um, and we don't often see them, and they're extraordinary. Because they're much tougher, aren't they, and sort of cruder um, than the uh, rather sort of delicate and elaborate Miltonic ones, if we just look back. Um, these are your classical high art, uh, Blake, um, and this is your popular speak directly to the people, Blake. <laughs> 
and that's Christian at the wicket gate and the little woodcut is always that it shows Christian coming up and knocking on the gate and he's still wearing his rags he hasn't been given celestial raiment and um, here is Christian meeting the fiend Apollyon who also is like a chapbook uh, figure figure from fairy tale and legend a sort of mythic beast with his wings and his scales and his dreadful uh, dart um, and, and it's a very dramatic uh, picture too because it says, you know, then Apollyon, Bunyan writes, espying his opportunity, began to gather up close to Christian and Blake pushes that Christian so close he's almost uh, embraced or embracing Apollyon and wrestling with him gave him a dreadful fall and with that Christian's sword flew out of his hand. Then said Apollyon, I am sure of thee now. And with that, he had almost pressed him to death so that Christian began to despair of life. But the way that Blake, we don't even need to hear the words, the way that Blake shows uh, Christian rising up is that you know that somehow this frail man is going to defeat this foul fiend. Um, and this kind of illustration is very, very direct. Uh, and, I, and the kind that I went back to, unlike the Miltonic ones, where uh, anybody looking at the book or being shown the pictures would sort of be able to tell the story to themselves. So that's just one example of uh, artists and, a, and in a, a particular artist, Blake, uh, responding to texts and following different modes, just as there are different modes of literature, the classical and the popular. Um, but then I looked at a, uh, another pair um, and thought of, of Hogarth, one of my favourite artists. And Hogarth also, uh, in, in his sort of high art mood, had actually done an extraordinary painting uh, in connection with, the, with um, uh, Paradise Lost, which is a sort of Satan, sin and death. And that was enormously influential on these sorts of artists. But if we were thinking of the people who read uh, Bunyan, the prince of Hogarth that they would know would be things like the idle and industrious apprentice or the four stages of cruelty, the sort of teaching works and the satirical works. Um, and I suppose this fits, I know you've, uh, some of you will have heard uh, people talking about satire recently, um, and that fits with the satirical tradition as well. And these two really were good friends and um, I often like to, to think of them, I like, uh, they were very very different. Uh, Fielding is aristocratic, he's well over six foot, he's always sort of elegantly, shabbily elegantly dressed, known for, uh, had a, a sort of long velvet coat which covered in snuff which he pawned all the time and then he'd get it out of the pawn shop for a first night of one of his plays or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, Hogarth <laughs> is only five foot and he's a, a, a mm. real sort of, he's not a cockney but he's born of course just round the corner in, in uh, Smithfield. Um, uh, stroppy, strutting, pugnacious, uh, hard-looking bloke. And yet they were great friends. And if you imagine them walking around Covent Garden together, uh, you think what an odd pair uh, they would be. Um, this is Hogarth's uh, frontispiece to the works of Fielding, 1762. Uh, eight years after Fielding's death, he died young. He died uh, in Lisbon seeking for fine weather and health. Um, and, and Hogarth has shown us, just in the illustration, what kind of man he wishes us to remember, so that he's a magistrate. He has his law books. Uh, he has the scales. You could just see he has the sword of justice and the pen. But he's also the dramatist with the masks um, and the author and, and above uh, I don't know if you can see just on the side of the book it says that the other side Jones, the end of Jones we're all supposed to know, actually it just says owns because everybody is supposed to know ah oh, there's Tom Jones um, so it's an affectionate and yet a sort of dignified uh, a treatise um, and they really did start out together, they were both uh, young men, both very influenced by John Gay's Beggar's Opera, which was put on in 1728, which turns the whole 
of the polite world upside down by showing uh, the adventures of, as it were, McHeath and, and uh, the jailers and the thief takers. And everybody could make a connection between the high women on the stage and uh, Walpole in power. And yet you could say, no, 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 it's not satirical. It's just good fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's very much what Hogarth did too. Um, he, his uh, first really successful series of prints was this, which is a harlot's progress. Um, and in this one, we can see a young Mole, uh, Mole Hackabout, she gets called, uh, arriving in town, innocent girl from York. Um, but we know that she's being rather foolish. We just see the silly goose, you know, its head over the side of the basket. Um, and uh, she is being chatted up by uh, Mother Needham, a notorious board in Covent Garden, while the clergyman on the horse behind uh, turns his head, looks the other way, even though all the buckets are falling down, terrible things are happening. And the real villain of the piece is lurking in the doorway behind, and that's Colonel Charteris, who was a notorious uh, seducer and even rapist and had just been tried for assaulting a maidservant and acquitted because he had so many uh, friends in power. And when Charteris died just before this, uh, just after, sort of shortly after the trial and just before the prints were published, um, the people of London uh, gathered and uh, hurled sort of dead dogs and cabbages and anything they could find uh, into his grave. But again, Hogarth could say, uh, what do you mean, Colonel Charteris? And because Charteris is close to Walpole, it's also sort of saying, oh, you're the real uh, villains that um, everybody is being procured to. You are the people that are actually sort of raping and uh, assaulting us. But he didn't really need to do that. And Fielding at the same time was, was doing his own beggar's opera. He'd um, gone off to uh, Leiden to University, come back to England. And before he wrote his novels, he put on these wonderful irregular dramas, which is the little satirical play after the main play. And one of these was called The Covent Garden Tragedy. And, and he turned a classical drama upside down and his prologue says exactly the same thing. He's going to do just what Hogarth has done, uh, just the same time. And instead of showing people in Greece and Rome, he says he's going to, from Covent Garden, cull delicious stores of bullies, boards, and sots, and rakes, and whores. Examples of the great can serve but few, for what are kings and heroes faults to you? But these examples are of general use. What rake is ignorant of King's Coffee House? And that's his, his audience, and Hogarth's audience are the same, and they're using that London world to to uh, satirise the great. And they were both particularly interested in the idea of the mask and the person. Tom Jones is very much about finding out who is true and who is false and who is sincere and who is insincere, who the hypocrite is. Um, and Fielding actually wrote of Hogarth that this is just what Hogarth's doing. Um, he had a magazine called The Champion and in which he wrote... In his excellent works, you see the delusive scene exposed with all the force of humour, and on casting your eyes on another picture, you behold the dreadful and fatal consequence, like the rake and indeed moral are going to come to a terrible end. So you could always pretend that these stories are real serious moral tales, whereas actually, of course, the fun is the hijinks and they get up to uh, on the way there. Um, and then Fielding goes on, I almost dare affirm that those two works of his, which he calls the rakes and the harlot's progress, are calculated more to serve the cause of virtue and for the preservation of mankind than all the folios of morality which were ever written. And a sober family should no more be without them than without the whole duty of man in their house. And I heard someone chuckle, and that's right, this is completely tongue-in-cheek because um, Fielding is actually writing and the persona, I think it's of Captain Vinegar here. And, and uh, you wouldn't really expect a sober family to have uh, the harlot's progress standing you know, on their kind of hall wall. We might nowadays. <laughs> so people came in and said, oh, look what lessons we are learning from this. <laughs> um, but they, 
they did continue to work together. Um, Hogarth called his Prince of Drama a dumb show uh, in which the men and women were his actors. And Fielding constantly refers to Hogarth and says he wants Tom Jones to be like the work of a certain comic uh, history painter, a new form, new, new things that they're trying to do. And then, of course, they work absolutely directly together. Now, this is, as you can see, nearly 20 years later. Um, they've worked together all the way through. And in 1748, uh, Fielding became a magistrate. He, was a, uh, left, he, he had left the theatre in the late 1730s when Walpole shut down the irregular playhouses. Uh, he, then he wrote his novels. He always had uh, this sort of attacking journalism as well. Um, and in 1748, he became a magistrate at Bow Street, not far away. Um, he was a very fair, uh, but compassionate uh, magistrate and very, very much concerned about the condition of the poor. He wanted MPs to do, we could do it today, couldn't we, to actually go into the houses of the poor and see what the conditions are and not just pontificate from Westminster. And he felt that a lot of the misery of London in particular was due to the sale of adulterated gin, uh, which literally uh, rotted the mines. And so he uh, was campaigning to have uh, the Gin Act introduced, which would actually license the sale of gin. He didn't want, to, as it were, to take away the tipple of the poor, whereas the rich can have their claret, but the poor can't have their gin. It was actually to uh, alter this poison. And, and to help him, Hogarth uh, produced these two prints, companion prints, Gin Lane and Beer Street. Beer Street shows a, a fairly sort of happy, prosperous nation where the houses are going up. And here, I think, he really uses his art to campaign. As in all Hogarth's work, at every corner you look, there's something is going on. Uh, there are the little charity children with the cross on their back. They're very concerned about the next generation. Um, the people, the workmen who are pawning all their tools, um, uh, life is going so slowly that a snail can even crawl up uh, somebody's arm. And of course, in the middle, the ballad singer is starving uh, and is dropping his... His, his ballads, but uh, worst of all, this a female figure in the middle who could be Britannia, could just be an ordinary woman from uh, the slums of St. Giles. Is, is she isn't throwing her baby into the abyss. She's just letting it fall, which is almost worse. She just doesn't know what's happening to her child. And this was what uh, Hogarth said, you have to stop. And all the angles, if you're thinking of it as an artist, all the angles, all the light, the collapsing houses, everything is at uh, a, a, a sort of attacking uh, each other. And the whole way that the perspective of the print goes is that it's almost like we, there's no, there's no foreground. We, if we're not careful, are going to fall into that abyss too. Uh, and they were effective working together, and the act was introduced. Uh, but I think that they both show how uh, one person's art... Hogarth never let his own art become an illustration of something. He produced the pictures and images that he wanted to in his own way. And similarly, Fielding's prose was really new uh, and different, but they learnt from each other and they worked alongside. So that's quite a remarkable encounter between an artist and a writer, and very different to, say, the illustrators of Milton or Bunyan or even Blake, who is responding to a text that has already been written. And then, if I look just at the sort of third kind of encounter uh, that um, I was going to mention today, the one where the illustrator and artist don't have the same program necessarily at all. They're uh, quite independent beings, but uh, the illustrator, and it, I think it follows from a talk you had on book illustration uh, last week, where actually in the 19th century in particular, uh, book illustration really, really, really takes off. Um, and uh, here, when you think about artist and illustrator, 
Uh, one is actually commissioning or choosing the other very often and they're instructing or telling them uh, what they want to see. Not necessarily here is the story you illustrated, but it's, it's, a, it's a much more intimate uh, personal relationship. And I began by thinking about um, children's books and, <coughs> and then particularly thinking about um, Alice which is a topsy-turvy world of a very different kind to Gin Lane. Um, and uh, C.L. Dodgson, Lewis Carroll, actually began writing his fairy tale for Alice in November 1862. And he chose uh, Tenniel to illustrate it, because, uh, not because he's known as an illustrator of children's books, but... but um, he, he liked his illustrations for Aesop's Fables, actually, um, and uh, for Punch. He liked his sort of satirical edge. Uh, and Tanya was far more famous uh, than Lewis Carroll, and so it was the illustrations that first caught the artist's attention. Um, and here we've got the uh, caterpillar with his hooker and the wonderful white queen. Um, uh, but Tenniel wasn't free. He, Carol had done his own manuscript illustrations and, and Tenniel followed a lot of them quite uh, precisely. Uh, but he did draw uh, on his own background uh, and he used sort of models also from uh, his satirical uh, work so that, and other people as well. There's a lot of borrowing in illustration and it's usually not seen as plagiarism. It particularly ca happens with cartoons and you see it very much today. You see Steve Bell or Martin Rosen says after Hogarth or after Gilray or after so Everybody actually, it's like talking to their forebears. So um, the uh, uh, Tweedledum and Tweedledee that Tenu created are versions of his own John Bull. And, and this caterpillar with the hooker, um, John Leach, who was another illustrator of the day, had done a cartoon of the Pope as an Oriental potentate. So there's a different little joke in there. They, people would remember uh, Leach's Pope. Um, but it wasn't an easy relationship because Carol checked absolutely everything. And Tenure got very, very fed up and, and dismissed him. He called him a conceited old don. Um, and he refused to illustrate uh, through the looking glass. Um, but then Carol couldn't find anybody else. I, I, I'm not quite sure whether the word had gone round and said, do, do not work for that man. But in the end, Tenniel agreed. Um, and yet they are very much his pictures. It's, a, it's an odd um, sort of a fusing of brilliance. I mean, you would think from this that, that artist and writer got on absolutely perfectly. But I think that that tension, perhaps because of it almost, um, tenure can make us feel the kind of pressure that Alice is under. And this is one, I think, of the most uh, brilliant uh, illustrations. And it's engraved by the Dalziel brothers, who I think you've also been mentioned in earlier lectures. And this is her shrinking and growing and her arm just going out of the window. It's a, it's, it's a frightening uh, illustration. It comes from one of uh, Carol's own conceptions, and yet it's made extremely powerful, um, taking you beyond uh, the realm, as the whole book does, you know, beyond the, far beyond the realm of the children's tale. Um, but whereas it seems so fine for us now, we're still very used to children's books being illustrated, but we don't have illustrations in our adult novels. We do, thank goodness, have actually a new tradition growing year by year, which is that of the graphic novel, which is a different thing. But in Victorian England, um, adult novels uh, were uh, really uh, illustrated, especially as the print technology allowed them to uh, carry more illustrations. Um, and, and many authors actually absolutely hated it. And George Eliot, uh, Frederick Layton was going to illustrate Romola, and she just, she said, it's not my Romola, I, I can't see it. Um, Henry James was uh, deeply distressed when uh, photographs were integrated into his work. Um, and they're like, uh, James particularly, next generation, because the big folk had by that time 
kind of Picard and Sword boom was collapsing again. And that vogue was very much began with Dickens. Uh, and of course, uh, the Dick illustrations of Dickens are, are another of my, my favourite uh, sets of illustrations. Dickens was absolutely soaked in the world of prints. Uh, he was a great admirer of Hogarth, of Rowlandson, and of Gilray. And he used this Oliver Twist subtitle is A Parish Boy's Progress, which takes you back to Hogarth's Harlot and, and the Rake, and to Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. It's, 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 that is a particular kind of story. And he once he told John Forster that he didn't invent his story. He said, really do not, but see it, see it underlined and write it down. So it was a slight problem here in that he wanted his readers to see his stories, but just the way that he saw, he saw it. Um, he, he wanted an illustrator that he could work so closely with that they almost could see it together. And he specified the scene, he specified the characters, he told his illustrators exactly what he wanted, even their gestures, even the furniture. And when he began with uh, Pickwick, Pickwick was supposed to be a book which actually followed uh, the illustrator. It is an idea of the illustrator Robert Seymour, who suggested a series of scenes, of visual scenes of sporting life and Cockney wit. And so the publishers, who were Chapman and Hall, set out to find an author. And uh, several writers said no. And then this young Dickens, who was 24, uh, said okay. But then he, uh, knowing his, he, he knew who, what he was from the very start. He insisted that he wasn't going to follow the illustrations. The illustrations must follow the text. Um, and not because of that, but shortly after, Seymour uh, committed suicide, and there was a great hunt for a replacement. And um, eventually they found another young man, this 21-year-old uh, engraver, Hablot Knight Brown, and he signed his first works as Nemo, no one. As he was going to be obliterated by Dickens. And then he thought, oh, I can match Dickens, and Dickens was being boss. So Hablot Knight Brown became Fizz, and so that amazing partnership was born. And this is an illustration from Pickwick. This is Mr. Winkle's situation when the door flew to. And this, as you can see, is taken from the umpteenth edition. It's a little OUP illustrated edition, uh, but it's still absolutely... Uh, clear because the composition is so good but the trouble behind that was uh, considerable uh, not the trouble but the toing and froing the working together and um, Dickens would always comment on the design he'd write little notes around the side and then Fizz would write his notes back and so on so this one goes uh, um, Dickens says uh, on the first draft and this is after Fizz has followed his instructions. Winkle should be holding the candlestick above his head, I think, as indeed he now is. It looks more comical, the light having gone out, so he's holding this candle without a flame <laughs> over his head. Um, a fat chairman. Uh, so, um, so short as our friend here, uh, never drew but breath in Bath. He loves the short fat. Um, person who, who's supposed to be carrying the sedan chair. I would leave him where he is, decidedly. Is the lady fully dressed? Is she fully dressed? <laughs> she ought to be. And then Fizz writes back, shall I leave Pickwick where he is? Now Pickwick's in the second floor window, first floor window. Um, he says, uh, I think that uh, actually in the text he's in bed. He said, you know, she put, you put him under the bedclothes, he'd be invisible. I can't carry him so high as the second floor. Now that's the composition speaking. If he took it up higher, the actual action would be squished. So Dickens obligingly, he often did alter the text for Fizz, brings him down a flight and puts him in a bedroom on the first floor instead. Um, uh, but Dickens wrote about everything, even facial expressions, like Sergeant Stubbin, who doesn't appear in this, but in other Pickwick uh, papers, he, he said... Um, he thought, this, imagine you're an illustrator, this is what you have to follow. He should look younger and a great deal more sly and knowing. 
He should be looking at Pickwick too, smiling compassionately at his innocence. So Fizz has got to imagine it, as he brilliantly does, sort of from the inside, so that that little tiny expression, tiny, on Sergeant Stubbins' face will make him look young, sly, knowing, and uh, understanding uh, Pickwick's compassion. Um, and they work together, although Dick is already dealing with Cruikshank on Oliver Twist, but after that, he and Fizz set off for Yorkshire and to find the models for <coughs> Do the Boys Hall. Um, and again, it was, it was Fizz who drew the two brothers who became the Cheerable Brothers and Dickens sort of wrote them in. Um, and then they worked together for 20 years. They did David Copperfield, Dombey and Son, Martin Chuzzlewit, Bleak House and Little Dorrit. And it was becoming harder and harder for Fizz as Dickens' uh, prose became, as it were, more elaborate, more detailed, more... There was so much in it uh, that it was almost beyond the reach of, of illustration. Uh, Little Dorrit, the usual notes kept coming. Uh, Mrs. Plornish is too old and Cavaletto a little bit too furious and wanting in stealthiness. But Fizz did deal brilliantly with it, particularly with the, with the um, comic elements, um, as he had with the wonderful uh, Micawbers from David Copperfield, truly sort of joyous uh, mid-relationship book. Um, I, and the, the um, caption is very good too, I think, restoration of mutual confidence between Mr. and Mrs. Micawber. <laughs> um, but when we get to Little Dorrit, this is um, a priceless one. This is Mr. Flint, which has a bad attack of irritability. <laughs> she is really shaking her to death. And there's this terrible little imp behind, coming up behind. And our wonderful uh, melodramatic villain sways in his black cloak in the shadows. So he could do that, but the gloom of the novel, I think, was sort of too much um, for Fizz, who had done some almost completely black uh, prints for Bleak House to fit the mood and had been much mocked because of it. And so they parted, and uh, Dickens wanted a new style, and uh, Fizz uh, began working uh, for others too. And their last work together was A Tale of Two Cities. But... I think it is a magic uh, uh, subject, the relationship, both between artists and texts and artists and writers in all their different ways. Uh, and the illustrations, as I, this, is, this was how people saw Dickens. I mean, Dickens wanted them to see the story as he saw it. But, but I think actually for generations, people saw the story as Fizz saw it. Um, but just to... And I want to sort of zoom both up, back up to the, the present, really, uh, or and back to the first subject, which is an artist responding to a text. Um, and I think that you can have this uh, other kind, which I uh, haven't really uh, talked about, but is another dimension, again, where the artist's work is both a brilliant response to a poem uh, as Blake's was, and a perfect illustration as well. And this is uh, Mervyn Peake, um, illustration of uh, Coleridge, um, the albatross, which is an extraordinary image, terrifically uh, modern. It's of an image of the 20th century, of that terrible, fateful century. Um, and yet it's also a perfect illustration uh, of Coleridge's rhyme of the ancient mariner. So I hope that's given you uh, just a little glimpse of, not necessarily of the subject, but of the kinds of things that uh, I think are fascinating, and you can doubtless find uh, many more of your own. So thank you very much. Thank you.